you spend time around prairie chickens or sage grouse, or, the lek is stationary. The, time, the birds, the males are there all the time and they breed and they breed and they breed and the, the hens all come to them. Well, in the turkey world, the lek moves around. Hit that, no, go back and hit that bottom arrow. Oh, okay, gotcha. And we went through this. This is what it looks like. So this is four times that were marked together in Louisiana. And if you press play there. Just saying that's not marked out. Do you, do you scroll up to the screen? Watch the dots. You see the four dots that are moving around on the landscape? It's a red and a blue, and then there's two other times. That's what the legs look like. They come and go. Sometimes they'll stay together all the time. Some will move off for a day or two. They'll come back. So this is why you see during the spring, you'll have a tom that's always got a partner with them all the time. One day there's three of them, the next day there's four of them, then the next day there's back to two. This is this, That's what this looks like. What those singletons are doing that are moving away from the, that pair is they're trying to breed. They're trying to find a hen that will accept them as a breeder. But the way this works in turkey world is most of the hens want access to those two dominant birds. Because that pair that's moving together, that contains the dominant bird. The birds that they're moving off, they're not the dominant breeders. So that's what these hens are doing. They're trying to find you know, that, that, that pair that has a, that one dominant bird in it. And if you just click that. Was that over a course of a... It was about a month. So now we'll go back over here. Yep, right there. So if you look at the turkey world, it kind of starts in the winter, right? So what these flocks are in the winter, we used to think until about a month ago, actually. For the last 50 years, we've assumed that these winter flocks, based on work done in the 1960s and 70s, that these, there were sibling groups. And what, what does sibling mean, right? It means related to each other. The problem is that the person that made those observations back in the 1960s used the word sibling because um, he, he thought that these birds had been raised in the presence of the same moms four or five hens that were in a big brood flock and they had a bunch of poults, he called them siblings. In reality, what we've determined very recently with genetics data is they're not siblings. They're not related to each other. And in fact, these winter flocks contain birds that don't know each other. They weren't raised around each other. They get in these winter flocks and they establish dominance hierarchies. And then when they split in the spring that we'll talk about, their relatedness goes down even further. They're not around kin when it comes time to breed. But what we do know is that there's social hierarchies within that flock. So there's a couple of groups of birds that will start jockeying for position within that flock because presumably they're trying to set themselves up as breeders, right? When they come out of those winter flocks. And although you'll see scenarios like this, uh, like this guy, this is February. Uh, I start getting calls every year where they're strutting. It's February 20th, they're breeding. It's gonna be over with. No, it's not. This is supposed to function. This is the way turkeys are supposed to function. They strut and they display and they gobble in these winter flocks, but there's very little breeding that occurs. Then what happens is, this is a favorite time of year, you start seeing these little pockets of turkeys, the light bulbs, right? Little pockets of birds, there's three strutters in a field, and I've got eight hens with them. Well, that's the exploded lex that you're seeing, these spots where they go to every year. And what we know is within that group of those three times right there, there's one dominant breeder. His presence will force testosterone levels down in those other two times to where in many situations, they're not capable of breeding. And if they are capable of breeding, their sperm fertility counts are quite low. In his absence, the other birds are going to presumably step up 
And what research has shown is that's not true. You can remove the dominant tom from that group, and those subordinate toms may or may not become, become breeders that spring, not just within a day or two, the entire breeding season. And that's the importance of dominance in this bird. It, again, from day one, they have these hierarchies. There's this abstract concept called kin selection. And what that means is, if you're a subordinate bird, but your brother is dominant, it behooves you to stand there and display with your brother in hopes that he's going to become a breeder. Because if he breeds more hens, it indirectly affects you positively. Does that make sense? Because you're his brother. We've assumed for decades that this functions in turkeys because it was shown to, to function in Rio Grande's. Recent work we just finished a couple weeks ago suggests that's not the case in these. A lot of these toms that are in these groups are not related to each other at all. If they are, they're distantly related, meaning they have a common grandfather or a common grandmother, or, you know, I'm talking generations ago. So the bottom line is uh, kin selection may or may not function in these things. And what that means is these birds that you're seeing in the spring, they may not know each other. They, they weren't hatched together. They ended up in winter flocks together, and then when they split out of those winter flocks, they became these, these little small social groups of toms that we see, not necessarily brothers. So one thing we know in the turkey world, and, and this stuff looks messy, but it's easy. I don't, this is the number of gobbles. This is day, okay? And over on the, the right axis, that's the percent of incubating hens in the, in the population, okay? What we know, in the turkey world is that toms become receptive about you know a month and a half before hens do. In other words, they start gobbling and strutting. Their testosterone levels skyrocket. The hens walk around them and they ignore them. You've seen this. It's like, what? They're strutting, they're raising hell, and the hens are like, don't care. That's because her body is not primed yet. Uh, all those toms are doing is displaying for her in hopes that when it's time to breed, she's going to come back to him. What you see with gobbling activity is it ramps up in March in the deep south. You see these peaks, they go up one day, down one day, up for a couple days, down, up for a couple days, down. Toms become cycled to each other. So in other words, testosterone levels within a population of turkeys, they oscillate all together. If your buddy's gobbling, you need to be gobbling. If your buddy's not gobbling, why waste your time? And we hear this every day we go turkey hunting. Yesterday they were Raising hell today, I silent. That's because you see these oscillations in testosterone, so there's no motivation to gobble on some days. What this peak is showing is right here. And what these data are right here is looking at a relationship between gobbling and nesting. So what we see in the Deep South is one peak in gobbling activity that has no nesting activity at all associated with and that's what you see here in about March 15th to March 20th in the Deep South. Lots of birds gobbling, no hens are nesting, or very few hens are nesting. Then you see this positive peak associated with nesting peaks, gobbling declines, right? Why would a tom continue to gobble if all the hens are nesting? When they start nesting, they're not receptive anymore, copulating. So we see these predictable lulls in gobbling activity as you start getting peaks in incubation because there's really no, there's no incentive to continue to gobble your head off. And then after the season, this is a site in South Carolina, you can actually see the hunting stopped here and then you saw dramatic increases in gobbling and that's very common. We see that in a lot of our Southern populations. The bottom line is um, it's about 45 days. So in, in Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, anywhere in the deep south, you should expect to start hearing gobbling 45 days before any breeding is occurring. And that's generally what we see. We also know that- Hey Mike, hey, right, so you're talking about all the hens are on the, on the nest. Right, you've got other hens on your property. They're unable to, or what happens to the other birds? Not every, not every hen is going to be on the nest, right? Or not able to. Well, like we're going to talk about, they're supposed to be synchronized to where all nesting is occurring at the same time. 
unfortunately, that's not the way it's working out. Okay. They're supposed to all be synchronized, and I will show you what that looks like. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. So we also know that not all toms are created equal, right? So this picture, I love this picture. You got to think what the guy on the right, you know, what he's pondering in his tiny, tiny little turkey brain. You know, there's this copulation event going on beside him, and he's not even a player. Um, we know that dominance matters, and you may say, well, yeah, come on, what, what, what's the deal? Well, research has shown in captivity that dominant toms they have lower parasite loads, and that's important because lower parasite loads mean better body condition. They're bigger, they're more aggressive, behaviorally, they're always on edge, if you will, because they feel better, right? There are also morphological traits that hens can detect. They have better iridescence, they're shinier. And you and I, we may look at them and go, it looks like two toms to me, but they, the turkeys perceive their environment differently than we do. We also know that snood length and other parts of his morphology matter. Things that you and I look at and we can't detect, they can perceive and they know that that's related to dominance. So what these hens are doing is they're going out and they're selecting these birds based on these traits that are heritable, right? So not only does dominance matter, but dominance genetically carries through generations, okay? If that makes sense. What makes a dominant tom is the same now as it was 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We also know that jakes don't contribute anything. If you look at sperm counts in jakes, uh, about 6% of all jakes that are collected in the spring, collected, killed, have sperm counts that are capable of fertilizing the clutch. Um, what that means, not that they do it, but they have enough sperm to do it. So if you think about it from, a, from a, that standpoint, the notion that, well, if you kill all your toms, the jakes will just pick up the slack, but that doesn't hold water. We also know that multi-parentage is important. Some work on Rio's has shown, and we're, we're seeing the same thing in Easterns. A lot of these clutches have more than one tom in the clutch. So she'll lay 10 eggs, and six of them are for one tom, four of them are for another. Or in extreme, you will see some of this, like nine are from one tom, and one is from one other. We see all kinds of situations like that. And we also know if you look at the captive literature, anybody raise chickens commercially? Been around people? Do you know how often they are officially inseminate their, their hens? Once a week. There's a reason they do that. It improves flock fertility. In other words, they want these hens repeatedly AI because the, the, the viability of the sperm starts to decline after a few days. So they, to improve flock fertility, meaning reproduction, they want to repeatedly copulate, they want these hens copulating in an artificial sense. That's the way turkeys are supposed to function. They're supposed to function in a way where they repeatedly breed with each other. You hear about sperm storage, right? This notion that, well, as long as she breeds one time, she can store all the sperm she needs for the entire reproductive season. That's Although it's true that they can store sperm, that's missing one important uh, consideration, and that is, look at these, the red bars, that's 30 days. That's about how long sperm maintains viability. So the black arrow is just the notion that once they breed, the sperm are declining in quality, right, through time. So if you look at the, the actual data, the blue bars, are initial nest, the yellow bars are second nest, and the green bars are third nest. And this is a population of Louisiana. Whoa. So what do you notice there? When do you think hunting starts on this population? It's right here, or it did. There are clutches produced out here that could not possibly rely on sperm stored from back here. Does that make sense? In other words, she's copulating, let's say the 7th of April, and she produces a second nest that's out here sometime around the end of May. Those sperm are not producing that clutch. It's sperm that she took sometime during this period, meaning she's wired to breed again. Have you ever heard this, this quote? This is, I get accosted on Facebook 
which is hell. Facebook is like Lucifer. <laughs> Instagram is like ponies and, and flowers. And Facebook is like babies. Uh, it's just the way it works. This notion that, well, as long as she copulates March the 15th, she'll be fine to produce a clutch because she lays in the middle of April, right? You hear this all the time. What that fails to recognize is that she's fertile until right at the end of the laden sequence. What that means is she, she can continue being receptive until the day she starts incubation. So if you were a Tom and you recognize that all the hens around you were about to become non-receptive, what would you do? It's 150 in the bar. Yeah. What would you do? Yeah. Your competition just skyrocketed yeah. because all of your opportunity is about to disappear, right? That, that decline in gobbling activity, it's about to happen because competition is going to disappear. So it's a panacea. That's what I referenced the sperm stores. It completely, the, the idea that they only have to copulate once ignores their breeding ecology from the start. You just can't simply assume that a copulation in March is going to produce a clutch in the middle of, of April. So back in the 1980s, if, if you go to Missouri, you read about turkey research in Missouri, there was a landmark study, it's still considered a seminal study, 10 year study in Missouri. And that work until very recently was the longest term turkey research that had ever been done. It was eclipsed by a project done in Mississippi State that I was involved in. And we've since, some of the work that I've got ongoing now has, is even longer term than that. But this guy named Bill Healy, he was asked by the Northeast States to write a document to tell them how to set turkey seasons, not just spring, but spring and fall. And he said, okay, I will take this data from Missouri, which was considered the best, and I'm going to use it to come up with biologically informative regulations. And I'm going to tell the agencies how they should structure a turkey season. If you go to the Northeast, you're going to see that many states in the Northeast follow that to a script. Pennsylvania, May opening weekend, 1st of May, based on their, their nesting college. And this is what he said. He listed some assumptions in this document, which is still considered the seminal document that we have for setting turkey seed. I didn't write this. I'm just telling you what it said. In this document, he said, there's two assumptions you can't violate. One, it has to occur after most breeding. Now, what we just talked about is they're still breeding when they're laying. In fact, competition to breed is highest during laying. Okay, so right before they go to incubate, that's when the money's kind of there. He said, okay, how do you make sure that you don't violate these assumptions. One, he said, you can't have a harvest rate that has a long-term effect on the population. Basically, you have to kill a surplus, right? And if you do that, then the population should sustain itself. And he used a 30%. In other words, you could kill a third of your toms every year. Um, factor that, put that back in the back of your brain. And he said, well, that's okay, but you violate the assumption if you disrupt breeding. In other words, killing 30% is fine, but if you do it too early and you disrupt breeding, then 30% is not sustained. They kind of caveated it. And then he said, well, how do you disrupt, not disrupt the breeding? Like, what would you do to avoid that? And he said, well, the first thing you would do is don't start killing toms until most of your hens are nesting. Because at that point, right, some of them are extendable. Breeding's done, you know, kill some of them, that's fine. And he noted, based on work done in here in this state, that toms are more susceptible, dominant toms are more susceptible early in breeding. And this was based on a study, Exum study thesis work in 1987, basically showing that if you go into a population and you, you smoke a bunch of your dominant birds out of it early, nesting slows down, and in some cases it stops. Some hens actually don't reproduce that year. Um, that work has been largely ignored until recently. 
The only thing I would point out about Bill's document, and I went and sat with him for a couple of days in his house and talked about this, the data that he used to create those recommendations, the pulp per hen ratios were almost four to one. Four to one. We haven't seen four to one in the deep south ever, like ever, consistently. And I'll show you those data. Here's the other one that I thought was funny. He said, um, you know, we held harvest rate, that's the percentage of times that you kill. We held it constant at 15%. I said, why did you do that? He said, well, we had to pick a number. And we went ahead with 15 because we didn't really think we'd ever see days where you harvest like 40 or 50% of your time. As an aside, we routinely see harvest rates on our public lands exceeding 40 or 50% every year. Now. So the bottom line is these, these recommendations were generated under making lots of turkeys and not killing that many of them. That was the, rec the set of recommendations that we gave. Okay, so what are we seeing now, right? What's the data show? Where, are, are we following the recommendations? And, and you know this. If you're in this state, Georgia, any other state in the South, those state agencies summarily dismiss these recommendations. And seasons have never been set based on biology in the South. And I've lived in the South my entire life. I grew up in Virginia. I shot birds in the fall. That's how I learned how to turkey hunt. Spring hunting was not even a thing when I was a kid. So I chased flocks around all over the hardwood forest of Virginia, flushed flocks up, shot hens, shot jakes, shot toms, shot whatever, turkeys. That's how I learned turkey hunting. So the bottom line is um, the state of Virginia where I grew up, they never used biology. They used political pressure. The state of Alabama never used biology until more recently. They just caved to political pressure. You and I want to hunt. We want to hunt as soon as the birds start gobbling, and we want to hunt as long as we can. I'm a turkey hunter. I've been a turkey hunter since I was 12. I get it. I want to be out there. So let's look at some of the data. Oh, or maybe we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> So what you're looking at on the right, and I don't, you don't need to, I intentionally made this this size. I just want you to look at the black lines. That's pole per hen ratios across a bunch of southeastern states. And those data stopped in 2012. And what do you see? This general declining trend where we've been making fewer turkeys every year. If you look from one year to the next, no cause for alarm. When you look across 10 or 15 or 20 years, we have a problem. We're not making as many birds. Um, when I presented these data, the, the state agencies, all the state agencies in the South gave me their, their productivity data. And we generated these figures in 2011. And I went to a meeting in 2012 where all the state agency biologists, many commissioners were sitting there. And I showed this figure. And I said, folks, we got a problem. And we've had a problem for more than a decade. And if we don't do something about it, 10 years from now, we're going to be looking back and we're going to be kicking ourselves. And 10 years later, pole per hen ratios in most of those states are lower than, than they were in 2011. So we've known this was coming. There was fairly strong consensus at that meeting in 2012, something was amiss. The problem is that harvest in many states okay, was doing that, okay? We were, we were killing a lot of turkeys. We just weren't making it. And the reason that we're seeing this is because of the poults that we're producing, most of them are males. We see that very clearly. Most of the poults that are living, that you're seeing out right now, most of them are males. Why is that? We don't know. But most of those birds are males. We catch very few young hens in our winter flocks, very few. We catch a ton of jays. So harvest can continue to be fairly high where the population is actually declining, and that's what we've seen across the South. So is that saying 22% are lost in nests? Nope, and this, I was gonna point this out. So this is what our data from 2010 through 2022 shows. Using about 2,000 nests of Easterns, we see about 22% nest success, meaning 78% of all nests fail. Of those 22%, about a third of the broods will survive one month. What that means is about 7% of all nests produce one or more poles. So 93% of all nests don't produce a surviving pole. 
it's, it's hard being a turkey. The production in this bird is down to levels now where if you think about the math there, that doesn't add up. If you look at nesting chronology, this is something I get asked a lot about, and people don't believe it, but um, hey, when do, when do hens nest? Well, for the most part, it's pretty much the same every year. Yeah, it'll be different by four or five days, maybe one year to the next. This year, ironically, we were super late across all our populations, and we, we're studying North Carolina, South Carolina, Alabama, Georgia, uh, Tennessee, Missouri, Texas, Louisiana, the data from all those states, they were on average about eight or nine days behind <coughs> an average. Uh, we had a really, I don't know about here, but most of our sites, we had a really terrible acorn crop this fall. Um, and birds came out of winter in really crappy condition and it took them a while to catch up to, to be able to nest. So everything was late this year. But what you're seeing, just point, I just want to point out, this is the population in Georgia. The green arrow right here is when hunting starts. It did on that site. The blue and the red arrow is pointing to the peak in incubation that Bill recommended the season open about right then. This green right here is when all the toms in this population that were going to be killed were dead based on our telemetry data. So if you were going to die, you were dead by that point. Okay? So what do you see? Is the season opening too early based on those recommendations? Yeah, I mean, it's just reality. Why did it open March the 20th there? A lot of gobbling in, on March 20th, right? And I want to hear birds gobble just like you do. So that's been a historic opener across the south in you know, mid-March, mid and that's why. This is, you're going to look at this and go, oh my God, it's way too late. I'm hot, I'm tired. Just, I'm, I'm going to get you there, okay? Here's gobbling activity. What do you notice? Boom, down, boom, down. You know, this is what you and I experience every day that we turn on. Down here is date. You have multiple series of data right here, okay? Which your this, here's your opening date of hunting, right? This is that March 20th opener. You see gobbling activity doing this, and what happens after the season opens? They shut up. Now, are they all shutting up? No, some of them are dying. Some of the vocal birds are dead, but they didn't, they didn't kill all of them, right? So there's still a lot of turkeys out there. They're just not gobbling as much. This green line is that same green line from the previous figure. If you were a Tom and you were going to get killed, you were dead by that date. In other words, the end of the season sucks on these two study sites. Right? And we have almost zero birds harvested. And this is an average, I see two years, where 116 Toms that were killed in this, this data set. This bell curve, that's your nesting effort, right? That's your hens going to incubation, Many of them are failing, some are starting again. So you see this slow kind of tailing off, right, of nesting activity. Still have nest in July, shouldn't have that. Turkey should not be nesting in the south in July. And then this, this is your, um, your proportion of harvest. So basically, what do you notice right out of the box? I'm following my finger. How many toms were dead within the first week of the season? Half of them. Right? If you're going to be killed, you'll be killed early. Every state's data shows the same trend. You know, when the season opens, birds die. I mean, that's what we do. We go hunt turkeys and we kill them. If you let us kill them in March 15th, we'll shoot them then. If you open the season April 1st, we're going to kill them then. I mean, that's just the way it works. So we kind of started digging around, and Georgia DNR wanted to know, okay, well, what does that mean? Like, what should we be able to tell our hunters based on those data sets. What should they expect when they go out on these WMAs? So what we did is we compared, we basically modeled, pay attention to this B. You see this one is a positive, this one is a negative. When you model out the positive influence of female reproduction, receptivity if you will, how receptive hens are, that positively influences gobbling activity, as it should, right? So as you, you see these ramping up, if you will, and I've showed you the data, that's what it looks like. As hens start becoming more receptive, toms are starting to gobble. 
you see that's a positive beta. That means it should predict it to be positive regardless. And then you look on the right, this is the rate of change in traveling <coughs> as you remove toms. And what do you see? Obviously, intuitively, you see a negative trend. The problem is the beta is higher for that than it is the positive of hen behaviors. In other words, the, the influences of hunting activity and removing birds trumps their, not biting, trumps. <laughs> <It's getting late. laughs> Trying try anything I can be. Um, it trumps the positive of the female behavior. And what, what we did, we, we factored that out. And basically, for every four toms you remove across, it was about 2,462 acres or something like that, you would expect gobbling to be at zero. And lo and behold, the year after these data were generated, they killed 4.2 toms per 2,500 acres, COVID year. By the time harvest had gotten to that level, what do you think gobbling was? It was zero. By April the 13th COVID year, gobbling had completely ceased on this site. It was completely over. We had two days where we had some, some gobbling activity, not much. And ironically, one of those days was raining like hell. So, go figure. So, I'm about to wrap up. Bottom line is, you know, hunting is, research has shown that, what do you, what do you think the primary determinant of us being happy is? Gobble. Gobble. We want to hear birds. Now, studies have looked, there's been a few that said, well, I want to kill one. Well, hell, I want to kill one too. But if I can go hear birds, I go home happy. I'm okay. I don't. I can eat a tag, you know, if, if I hear birds. If I don't hear birds, I get mad. When would you hunt if you want to hear birds? Early. And that's the political pressure that you and I have put on our agencies and our politicians is driven on that. We want to hear birds. If you're familiar with any of the work coming out of Mississippi right now, there's some there's some experimental work. Um, I can show you the same data from WMAs in Georgia where we delayed the season opener. You see the same amount of gobbling April 5th that you did March 20th. Exact same amount of gobbling. If you don't disturb their breeding process, they function just like turkeys are supposed to function. And if you look at gobbling activity on a non-hunting site, we have an 80,000 acre non-hunting site where no 